it can take an absolute leap of faith to decide to leave. It can, it can take an act of the most amazing bravery that you can muster to get up. And the reason is these pesky trauma bonds that hold us bound, whatever it is that gets you to that point, or if you're discarded, or if you're considering leaving and you know just how hard it is for these to leave, then understanding the trauma bond and then under, and then having some ideas for what to do to help. What does it feel like when you're trauma bonded, when you're when you've been discarded, when you well, you want to go back. You want you want everything the way it was. You the way it was, you know, the good stuff. You can't remember the bad things. You possibly feel like you will never be loved again. You feel like it feels like absolute grief when you've been discarded or when you've had to leave. And it's it's beyond heartbroken. The most miserable, amazingly painful experience. You're having the experience of grief and loss when you should should be feeling elated and free, right? Your mind knows that this was toxic. This was not good for me. This was unhealthy. Your heart is completely bound to this person. The cognitive dissonance is extreme. It's knowing that this isn't good for you and feeling like it's death without it, right? So um, the constant spinning vortex of, but I can save him if only I do blank or her, if only I do blank better or differently. It's the strongest addiction ever. And you know how twisted it is all the while. Yeah. What's going on with your brain and body is okay. So a while ago, I talked about what happens when we have attraction and our brain lights up in like the primal part of the brain that controls breathing and heartbeat. It does not, it doesn't respond to logic and reason. It's the part of your brain that lights up when you have an attraction to someone. So that's like across the board. Okay. That lights up. That's what gives you the spark to go after that person or to single them out from the crowd. Okay. And then what happens is your emotions fire off in another part of your brain. And then in your neural cortex, your logic comes in and you have all the reasons why you love, like this person. So that's like in every relationship. Okay. But when you, you can just imagine what happens with that when you have, um, when you have abuse, right? This is going on in everybody who's got a partner. But when you have abuse, it's I'm sure it's firing. I don't know the actual what's firing, but you can imagine like the crazy neural reactions that's happening in your brain. So then when you have a trauma bond, when you break up, all those things are still firing. So the problem is the thing that's attracting you to the person is still going off in the part of your brain that has no logic. So what do you do? What do you do? And, and this goes on for everybody when there's a breakup. Now, when there's trauma bonding, there's added things happening. You've got... Um, you've got dopamine release from the breadcrumbing that they did. So when, when you have the love bomb and devalue, the reason it sets up this trauma bond, uh, the addiction part is it's just like a gambling addiction almost where you, you have loss and you have loss and you have loss. And imagine pulling a slot machine, you have loss and you have loss and you have loss and you have this feeling of needing to win, needing something, needing something. I need something. It creates need. So it's a kind of like sparsity, right? You, you have, if you have scarceness or sparsity, you, you have, it creates need. Well, the, the narcissist will set up this with the devaluing and the silent treatments and the, you know, all that horrible stuff. And then when they give you a, a love bombing or an ounce of, of breadcrumbing, even it surges your body with dopamine. So when that happens, <laughs> then you get where that dopamine feels so good that you need more of it. Well, that cycle is addictive. So when they're gone, it's like the ultimate silent treatment, okay? You're left with this dopamine need, okay? So you've got that going on. You've got your brain firing like anyone else who has a breakup where it's still in this part of your brain that has no logic going, I'm so attracted to them, I need them so much, right? So you can see where this is not easy stuff. So you've got to override it with a whole lot of logic, a whole lot of self-care and implement a whole lot of, we don't have to, I say gotta, but it's useful too. Let's put it that way. It's useful too. And it helps you move through it a little smoother.
regardless of what's happening, you know, you feel terrible. You feel like you can't get out of bed. You might feel like you are, um, like the world, it's like nothing matters. You might feel like the only thing that matters is getting them back. You might be so obsessed with getting them back, even though you know you don't want them back and you shouldn't have them back. You might know you don't want to contact them at all, ever. You don't even want them, but the urge to contact them comes over you like crazy and you can't, you feel like you can't stop it. So what can you do? Number one is acceptance that this is what it is and it is toxic. You, ha you have to accept that, that the person that was abusive to you was actually abusive to you. You have to accept, even if you have doubts, that, that a person can have no empathy. You have to accept that the patterns they set up in the relationship are their patterns. They were their choices. And that has nothing to do with you or what you could have done differently, but that this is the patterns that they repeat in their own relationships in their life. And that's them. They are who they are. And doubt's going to creep in, but you have to hold on to the fact that that isn't a relationship you want in your life and you can't change them. Okay. And the relationship was toxic. You, you just have to, there's a, there's a point where acceptance is kind of critical. If you can't accept it, things to do are some things like writing a list of the abuse down. That's always recommended so that you have something tangible to go back and look at that um, is a reminder. And, you know, support groups help with that too, because then you have validation from other people. So, so number two, self-care. Self-care, self-care, can't say it enough. It's number two for a reason. It's, it actually should be number one. So what does self-care look like? It looks like different things at different points in your life. It's taking care of yourself in where you, exactly where you are. So if you can't get out of bed, take a nap. If you can't get out of bed and you can't do anything and, and you know, it's only been like two or three days or something and you're, you know, you're just feeling grief, let yourself cry. Let yourself lay there, watch Netflix in bed, whatever you need to do. That's self-care at that point. At a certain point, you got to get up, right? So what do you do? You take a shower. Now, don't just hop in the shower and, you know, use the shower as a time to take care of yourself. Anything you do for yourself is self-care. So half the time we miss out on opportunities to show ourselves care because we're not paying any attention to the thing we're doing for ourselves, right? We're taking ourselves for granted. And the whole point is we've been taken for granted too long and we have to learn to have some um, self-worth. And the only way to find that is through oneself. It's all about how you take care of yourself. Okay. So make sure you eat, talk to people, take walks, cuddle a pet or a pillow, anything that makes you feel comforted and nurtured when you are going through uh, trauma bonding is useful. If you're at a, like, a little further along and the trauma bonding is still there and you're maybe like at the point where you want to contact them all the time, but the rest of it's okay in your day, you know, like you're, you're functioning, but you just really want to contact them. Self-care might be finding a class to take or um, something to um, take the focus off of the abuser and on, put it onto yourself. Okay, I could go on and on and on about self-care for hours. <laughs> And I have a coaching group just for self-care and it, you know, it's um, amazing to watch people go through that and start to change their lives. So it's, it's something I could talk about forever, but I'm going to stop and we're going to move on. So another thing that you, that needs to happen is you have to realize you're grieving. Okay. This is a traumatic situation and it's grief and it's a loss. So you got to feel what you need to feel. We can't be afraid of our feelings and try and hide from them. We have to allow the grief that is whatever you're feeling, you have to allow it. And at the same time, back to that self-care and nurture yourself through it. And that can mean calling a friend. It can mean journaling. It can mean um, anything that gets you to where you're allowed to express what you feel and feel what you feel without judging yourself or having anyone else judge you. So don't go to people who are going to tell you, just get over it, you know, things like that. That's not validating. It's not useful in the situation. If someone does that, just say thank you and walk away, you know. But um, there are people who will validate you out there in sport groups, um, coaching, whatever you need. So uh, make sure that you are 
taking care of yourself and nurturing yourself. You know yourself better than anyone and you know the types of things. And if you don't, then that's this is a great place to discover and a great way to use this pain. Okay, if you don't know yourself well enough to know what nurtures you, time to find out. Because this can be something where you can turn this horrible situation into something positive for yourself, where you discover things about yourself that help you later in life. So what nurtures you? What makes you feel cared for? And start doing them while you're feeling these feelings that are awful and you don't want to feel. Number four is journaling and getting it out. And not only journaling, as in writing your feelings down, but keep a gratitude journal. That's really useful to help everything's so negative and so dark and you, you just can't stay there as people especially empathic people we can't live in that gloom it's too much it's too heavy so gratitude journals help you to remember that there's good things out there and that you can focus on those support system number five have a support system so when you're super trauma bonded and you know it it is really useful to have a support system. Having people who have been through it, having people who are going through it currently, having people who um, have come out the other side and can talk to you about what it was like and how it will get better. Really, really important. People that understand what it's about, why it's happening, the little details, the fine nuances, you know what I'm talking about. So, you know, groups like SPAN, uh, therapist, coaching, um, the coaching, I have a coaching group just for that purpose. Um, it's all really validating. I wouldn't say friends and family in this case, unless they've been through it. Going to people who have not been through this, the likelihood of them understanding are pretty, it's, it's pretty low. Sometimes they will, and that's great. But in it's the problem is, if you don't feel understood, we're so vulnerable, when we're in this position, we're so we need so much validation. We need to experience uh, being heard and being understood, even more saying things that re really do sound a little crazy to some people. Like, why would you want to go back to them? You know, people will say, like, what? What's they don't get it. OK, so finding support group of people that actually get it is really useful. So know it gets better. You're just going to have to take my word <laughs> on this one. It does get better. OK, or I wouldn't be giggling at you here a little bit. Seriously, it gets better. It does. Know that it gets better and that you actually can grow from this experience. You can, all of these things I'm saying here, if you try even one or two, you will find that you have more self awareness, have more self respect. Th these are not just band aids, these are actually kind of life hacks, really. These are ways to go in my opinion, ways to go about making change in your life for your future. Number one, so that you can lead a fulfilling life. And number two, so that you can build resistance against anyone coming in and trying to take these things away from you again. One is important. Bring the focus to yourself as much as possible. Okay. Build your own life. Build your own life on the inside too. Right? And what I mean by that is the focus, the the drive and the desire to focus on, but they this, what about them? How come, how come the narcissist does this? How come they do that? Super important to understand what you went through and who they are and what it's all about and what, like, what gaslighting is and have your own examples. It's really important to get all of the info, right? The discovering and understanding is really, really important, but you also have to discover and understand about yourself. And the more you take your focus off of them and start placing it on yourself, the less these trauma bonds have a hold. And it's people always want to go back. I can't tell. I mean, it's it partially why I created the groups, the coaching groups for it, because sometimes it can help to talk to someone and have them say, okay, now what about you? You know what I'm saying? Like you, you're talking about maybe, um, and then they did this and then you want to tell the whole story about the horrible anniversary. And then, you know, and it's important we need to hear these things. But if we're talking about trying to break these trauma bonds and focus on a solution to what's going on, then sometimes it can help to just have someone say, now what about you? 
what can you do now? What, what's happening in your life? Like help direct you to move you forward and short of a coaching group, you, you know, do it for yourself. Stop perseverating on the narcissist. At a certain point, you just have to stop. And that might not be right away. You may have a lot of understanding that you need to go through, but at a certain point, you've got to shift your focus off of the toxic person and onto the one who's trying to heal, which is you, okay? But really bringing the focus off of them, you get the point, get it off of them and onto you and what you want, what you, positive things for yourself, okay? Number eight, block them everywhere. Block them, get rid of the pictures, get rid of the memories, get rid of the stuff. It, it's important to not have the constant reminders. It is an addiction, you wouldn't have, you know, alcoholic wouldn't sit with a bottle of alcohol on their desk all day or, you know, pictures of it on their phone while going to work, you know, whatever, and expect to not crave that very thing. So get rid of the reminders, get, block them. And no contact is for you. It's not for them. Okay. No contact is to keep you safe and um, break these trauma bonds. Okay. And another thing that you can do along these lines, besides just the block and get rid of pictures, is rearrange your house, especially if they lived with you or if they were over a lot. Rearrange your furniture. You get new stuff. Paint a wall. Do something to make the space of your home your own. Um, changing things up on the outside can kind of help. Can kind of help. We do have to change the inside, but <laughs> the outside can kind of help. So I know I said a few minutes ago about... Get, get your mind off of them. You also have to educate yourself on narcissism. Um, that helps a lot. Sometimes people do the opposite of obsessing and they don't want to look at it. What happens often is then they, they often um, think it wasn't so bad. It, it's a dissociative technique, right? And it, creates this abuse amnesia and it wasn't so bad. I can't actually remember what happened. I just, I just really miss them. Right. So in that case, educating yourself on narcissism can be super important. You can see why. And when that happens, triggers will start to happen. Allow those triggers. Those triggers are telling they're, they are waking up your feelings and they're, they're showing you truths. Okay. It's uncomfortable, but if you're a person that checks out and doesn't want to look at it and is feeling like you are, um, like, I miss them, everything's okay, it'll be okay, that's when you got to educate yourself more and more on the things that they're doing. Realize that a person without empathy won't change and that the, the, their method of communication and their method of relationship is toxic. It's not going to be any different. So you have to understand that, educate yourself on it, and... Um, as you feel, let yourself feel and go back to taking care of yourself and nurturing while you are having these new and horrible feelings. So remember that overwhelm, number 11, remember overwhelm is normal. It's normal to feel like you can't, you can't remember anything. It's normal to feel like you are, like every stress is just too much stress. It's everything's overwhelming. Um, yeah, that's, it's normal. It will, it will get better. It's just kind of part of it. So it helps to talk, to take breaks from thinking about it by spacing out and watching Netflix, whatever. Um, and having gratitude lists that has helpful. There's meditation. It's helpful to help with the overwhelm. Live in the real time. Ooh, that's hard when we want to go into our past and we're projecting into our future and we're trying to take the past and throw it into the future and take the future and the hopes for the future and drag it back to the past. And that's all we're doing. We're bouncing between the future and the past. You know what I'm talking about? We're worried about what, what will be, what will never be again, what, what we're worried about the future. And what we're doing is attaching to the past, which is the toxic relationship that we had, not that we have now. Okay. And, or if you're still in it, you do have it, but it's, it, that's even closer. That's even harder to, because you're, your future is your past, right? And we're not in the moment. The moment right now is where to live, especially if you've been discarded or if you are have left and you're feeling like you're in that 
push and pull between the past and the future, get into the real time, into the moment. So, you know, mindfulness is the number one thing I can think of there. And there's mindfulness practice, uh, mindfulness uh, like videos and whatnot all over YouTube. There's, um, I'd say 10 minutes twice a day minimum, uh, but just short ones, five to 10 minutes, not long, just short to get yourself train, start training yourself to calm down and come into the present moment and stay in the moment for five minutes. Okay. That is helpful. It, the reason it's helpful is this is where we actually live. <laughs> we don't, we miss it. We miss our life when we don't live in this moment. The past is nothing but something that's already happened and the future is not here yet. So this is right now is where we're living. So it's, it, it, it kind of, to me, it makes the hurt a little less because right now nothing bad is happening. Does that make sense? Unless of course, right now something bad is happening, but <laughs> right now, like it's pretty calm in the, in the, in the actual moment. And if, especially if you're sitting in meditation and you know, you're done with meditation, it's been five minutes. If you pay attention and you're like, Oh, my breathing's calmed. My thoughts are a little more calm right now. It's pretty good. Okay. And it's having those that space from all of the back and forth between the past and the future, just having moments of being in the present that actually helps you helps your nervous system calm down. So especially when you have been out of the relationship for a little bit and you've had some time to process what's happened and the grief is pot potentially lessened just a little bit, but you still feel you still feel like if they hoovered, you'd go back, right? Or you still feel the urge to contact them constantly. And it's time to start working on self-awareness. At, at a certain point, we, we get past the initial grief. And it's time to start working on the self-awareness part. And that is look for the hook, okay? Look for what is hooking you back. What is it in you that you need to heal? Does that make sense? Um, it can be things like, what do you fear? What do you fear? Why, wh what, what, what are you fearing? I'm afraid to be alone. Why are you afraid to be alone? Well, because I'll always be alone. That's not, that's not a real answer. Why are you afraid of that? You know, it was like really getting, start scrutinizing yourself a little bit, not in a mean way, but in a way that helps you ask yourself the questions you need to ask to understand what the real hook is. And when you get to that, sometimes you, you know, it can open up a lot of stuff. So this might be something with a therapist or a coach that is useful to just start looking for what is it in you that uh, is keeping you wanting to go back, right? Does that make sense? It's usually a belief we have. There's a hint. <laughs> a belief we have about ourself. I don't, I'm not, I don't deserve anything better. I'm not enough. I, I'm not, um, this is all there ever is. A belief about love. If you've only ever had, if you had narcissistic parents and you've only had abusers, of course, that's what love looks like. Why would you not go back to the easiest one? Why would you not go back to the one who's asking you back, asking for you back rather? You know, like that's, if you, if you realize your hook is, that's how I experience love. Oh my gosh, I know better in my head, but that's my experience. That's what I know to be true. So you look for your hook and start working on it. And that's where you, you know, that's a whole nother topic, but it's, that's the start. So thank you again for joining me. As always, I wish you the best on your healing journey. And as you uh, take back your life and thrive, don't forget to subscribe and hit the like if you enjoyed this or if this was useful to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.